This is Behind the Investigation, a podcast about the genre-defining new crime drama that tells the story of the investigation of Swedish journalist Kim Wahl's murder. I'm your host, Anna Kojarado, and this is episode two. The TV series The Investigation, presented by HBO, looks at the police work that went into solving the case of Kim Wahl's death. In particular, it focuses on Jens Müller, the Copenhagen police homicide chief who led the investigation and who was played by the actor Soren Marling in the TV series. Within hours of the story breaking, the case captured the world's attention and Jens found himself caught in the glare of the global media spotlight. At the same time, he also faced unprecedented challenges when it came to actually recovering evidence to secure justice for Kim. I'm delighted to be joined by the real-life Jens mother. I also have Tobias Lindholm here, who you will remember from episode one as the Oscar-nominated Danish screenwriter and film director, who wrote and directed the series. A quick warning before we go on that this show does talk about a violent crime, which some listeners may find distressing. I also wanted to note that while the investigation is based on real-life events, there are some spoilers for the TV show in this podcast. Jens and Tobias, welcome to you both. Thanks, Anna, and thank you so much for having us. Jens, could you please tell the listeners, in your own words, who you are and the role that you played in this case? My name is Jens Müller Jensen, and I worked for the Danish police force for over 37 years. I was an investigator for 30 years, and for about 25 years, I was the head of investigation. So this case was widely known as the impossible case, And we really get a sense of that in the second episode of the show, which in many ways just feels quite hopeless as we still don't know what's happened. There's no sign of Kim. And we learn from the prosecutor that the burden of proof on them is huge and they currently don't have anything to build a case with. Jens, your character sums it up when he says we have absolutely nothing. Could you tell me what it was about this case that first captured your attention and why did you decide to take a case deemed impossible? I'll start by mentioning that it wasn't a choice for me whether I wanted to work in the case. Being head of homicide in Copenhagen meant that I had to do it because the police must investigate every case involving a murder or a disappearance. On the one hand, the case was simple. Two people went out in a submarine and returned with one. The person who returned had to know what happened to the person who didn't return. On the other hand, the challenge for us was to work out what had happened to the missing Kimbal And of course, we had to prove our theories with evidence. This is the challenge that Tobias Lindholm describes extremely well and which is very difficult for us. We can theorize and hypothesize and piece it together bit by bit, but it takes a long time due to the fact that it involves many different teams and departments. Usually my crime scenes involving a person deceased are in parks or in a flat or somewhere accessible that I can deal with. In this case, the crime scene was in 12 meters of water and was filled with 38,000 liters of water. And it would be around two days before I had access to the crime scene. That's a very big challenge, as I had to bring the suspect to court. I couldn't access any information from the crime scene before I had to bring the suspect in front of a judge. Anyway, the suspect was taken to court and remanded in custody on the basis of suspected murder. And after that, we finally received the go-ahead to start our 24-day-long police work. That point where the prosecutor comes back and says that they have that four-week detainment period, it feels like a very crucial point because by this point, we've learned that there there isn't much evidence to go on, neither for the police nor for the prosecutors. So how significant was that moment when the accused was detained for that four-week period? This changed everything for me. I had feared that we would only keep the suspect for a period of three days and would simply not have enough time to investigate properly. The submarine appeared on a Friday and we would have had to work through the weekend on a great pressure whilst trying to get some evidence-backed answers. However, in the end we got four weeks, which meant that we could do an in-depth investigation across all areas and take the time needed. So we already have the scene set that the pressure is mounting in terms of the evidence and the time to gather more of it. But also when the story of Kim Val's disappearance first broke, it was immediately all over the news. And we see this captured in the second 
episode of the show, the press is constantly calling Jens's character's phone. The tabloids want to print unconfirmed rumors about Kim. Jens, why do you think that this case captured the world's attention in the way that it did? It did because it was a case that involved three different elements. A foreign, young, beautiful female journalist and a Danish eccentric who was semi-famous in Denmark for his projects and talks on building submarines and new rocket inventions. In addition, the fact that it was about a submarine somehow made it very relatable. Everyone can relate to the idea of a submarine and unintentional accidents, right? Most people have watched some kind of movie about a submarine trapped on the bottom of the sea. So these three elements combined resulted in immediate world attention from the very beginning. That was perhaps also due to the fact that, from the very moment the surviving person was brought to the shore, TV cameras were already there. They captured the whole scene, including the survivor's weird account. This meant that the people watching were able to get an instant, real-life feeling for what had just happened, which definitely generated immediate worldwide interest. And to be honest, do you agree or do you have anything else to add to that, you know, particularly as your position as a storyteller? Uh, what elements do you think really played out here that captured everyone's imagination with this story? I think the key word is exactly what you say, the imagination. We were given very little facts in the beginning. There was a lot of speculation and it left a lot of room for our imagination to run crazy. And with the elements Jens spoke of, those three key elements, that together with the human uh, imagination, uh, the story grew in all of our minds um, and therefore we could not look away. Uh, so, so I think that all the elements to trick our imagination was there and in many ways you can say that that's what we've been fighting against in the, in the writing and creation of the investigation. I'd, I'd like to talk a bit more about that because watching this unfold as a new story it, it completely dehumanized the story. It completely dehumanized Kim and the world was gripped by what, what seemed like fiction, but was a very real tragedy that was happening to a real family. And how did you contend against the, the kind of the, the horror show that was happening in the media and bring into the TV series the humane side and the reality of this story. When I when I first met Jens and and a bit later Ingrid and Joachim Wahl, I realized this. I realized that they had been dehumanized in the press coverage. I was not aware of that from the beginning, but meeting Jens and Ingrid and Joachim, I realized there was a very humane story there to tell. It all became headlines in the way we spoke to each other, and it and it does that, and and, and that's natural. But fiction. And um, storytelling, more than any other art form, can offer one simple thing. The opportunity to be somebody else for a while. The opportunity to be somebody else, in this case, for six episodes. And suddenly, by placing the audience in the shoes of uh, Jens Müller, that humanizes his job. And suddenly, we understand that what we thought of as... Uh, a crazy, fascinating story becomes real. And by slowing down the pace in that and just looking at it and allowing ourselves just to be in that, we also allow ourselves to understanding on a human level instead of on a fascinated uh, level where we can trick our imagination. And, and, and I think that in this case, identification is the key. The imagination had already been in play. Our job was to make people identify with Jens and with uh, Ingrid and Joachim. Some of the ways that I feel that really came across in the series are just the small, tiny details where you really see the 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 normal and complex nature of being a human. And so no one was presented in a very black and white way. All of the characters bring in their human nature uh, all the way from when someone might get upset or short tempered with, with somebody else or all of these kind of little hints that these are real people and these are not just characters in a fiction story, even though 
in this portrayal, that is what they are, but they are very much based on real people. I always find it extremely important for for, for us as storytellers to take responsibility of um, of humanizing. You know, every human being who grew up is so well educated in reading the world around them. That's what we do constantly. When we meet new people, we read them right away with our own uh, um you know, uh, previous things that has happened to us in life. We read that into the present. And we do that as well when we when we watch fiction, when we go to the cinema, we watch a TV show. Um, and I don't think we should force the audience to leave that talent behind. We need them to bring it in. And as they watch a TV show and as they listen to a story, they need to remember what they have seen and done in their life. For me, storytelling is basically 50% identification and 50% fascination. I often feel that police shows uh, have way too much fascination and way too little identification. And I thought that we, t- by telling this story, we needed to have at least 50% identification. We needed to understand these people. And the only way we could do that was portray them in a naturalistic way. And nobody carries themselves around in the world as big cliches. Everybody brings something special to the table. And that was, of course, the job of the of the actors in the investigation. One of the ways I really like how you capture that is through the character of Musa, one of the uh, investigators, who he's always eating. There are so many scenes where Musa is eating. And that, to me, just signaled... A, that's a real police officer to me. That it's someone who is working hard, doing their job, but hey, he's snacking a lot. Um, and uh, it was those. It's those small little uh, crumbs that you leave throughout the series that really bring these characters to life. And I don't know. Um, maybe Jens can answer this. Is do do you feel that the show really captured what it was like behind the scenes in a police station? and how the investigators work together, and particularly in the scenes where the characters were struggling to find something, they were um, poring over evidence and just, at many points, not even actually making that much headway. Is that something that actually happens in a real police investigation? Yes, it's very accurate. The way that Tobias describes all of this is very, very authentic. I've had so many people within the police force getting in touch to say that this is the most authentic show they have ever watched, from the realistic way the police are represented through to demonstrating the work they do. I personally love the characters, because for me, they all represent the great, supportive team within the police force that helped to investigate and solve the case. The way they're shown in the series is absolutely amazing, very realistic and authentic. I'd like to add something in regards to the media. The first court hearing was a private hearing, where the press only was allowed to hear the charges against the suspect and the judge's ruling. They didn't hear the explanation from the suspect. And this meant that a kind of your world, your rules situation occurred. The media and everyone following the case began making up their own stories and let their imaginations run wild. And the imagination can sometimes be much worse than reality. What kind of impact does that have on the investigation itself and working under these conditions where there is such intense speculation from all sides, uh, also, you know, all around the world, there's, it's not just local press, it's international press and there is just nonstop speculation. What impact does that have on being able to conduct a police investigation? A direct consequence for me was that I began receiving calls from many, many journalists from all around the world at all sorts of hours. The Danish journalist, whom I know well and have a good relationship with, only called between 7 a.m. and 10 p.m. But the international journalists, who perhaps are used to a different system and other way of doing things, call any time, night or day, 24-7. Obviously, this meant that even such a simple thing as being on the phone became highly stressful for me. It also meant that we, to a certain extent, also had to deal with all the rumors circulated by the media. But another thing it meant was that the friends and relatives of the suspect could maintain their own ideas that perhaps he wasn't guilty, or that there had to be another explanation in regards to his role, when they didn't know the answers to what he himself has explained, and because we couldn't divulge anything. So it also meant that it was difficult for us to get his friends to speak with us initially, because they didn't know the truth, 
and therefore still could maintain their belief that the suspect was innocent. So you've just touched a bit on the pressure and the stress that this investigation caused. Um, so I knew Kim personally, so needless to say, what happened has had a huge impact on me. But this case really shook the world and touched people who'd never met her before. For you, Jens, how did working on this case and also subsequently this the TV series, how did it impact your life? It makes sense that when one is investigating such violent, brutal crimes, it affects your mental health and overall well-being. It is one thing to be at work and use one's rational brain to discover what really happened, talking with colleagues or reading reports about the case. It's quite another once work is over, or you're walking from one meeting to another, when the mind starts to kick in and you start thinking about all the people affected, and of course, a young person who had her life stolen and had her whole life ahead of her and of course also the family of this person. And for me, this was awful, as it is in every case. And Tobias, obviously you've been working on the TV series. How has that impacted you and learning about the case and getting to know Jens and the Vals? How has all of that impacted your life? When I met Jens the first time, I had no idea that I was going to end up doing this story. I met Jens because he was chief of homicide in Copenhagen, and I'm a storyteller that tells stories reflected on reality. So for me to meet, you know, the sheriff uh, was interesting. During our cup of coffee and, and an hour's conversation, Jens told me a thing that surprised me. Suddenly he told me all of the hard work and about the friendships and uh, his friendship with, with Ingel and Joachim and the relationship with... Uh, with him and, 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 and the divers and with the Swedish dogs that were helping them. And then suddenly I realized that that story of darkness and brutality that had happened back in 2017 represented something else in that there was a hidden light, a light that was a proof of our system working, of the civilization of Denmark actually working, the democracy of people doing their jobs, of people being there for each other, of friendships growing out of a very dark place. And I realized that that was an untold story. We had gone crazy in telling each other about all the brutality of this case. And suddenly, by talking to Jens, I realized that there was a, a different story to tell. So when we went over to Inge and, and Joachim's house, and, and I had a, a chance to, to talk to them, Jens picked me up by my office, and we would we would drive over there and... And, and for those watching this, there, there is a lot of car scenes in, in the series. And, and that was all developed that day since I was in Jens's car and it was a mess. It took Jens probably seven minutes to clean up the car be before I could enter. And when I entered, I still had to sit with, with guns and hunting equipment between my legs. And as I remember it, Jens' phones would ring constantly during that one-hour drive to, to Trelleborg. So, so I just took all of that copy-paste and, and put it in there as, as Jens Müller's car in, in the series. Um, but we came over to, to, to Ingel and, and, and Joachim's house, and I met them, and I met their beautiful dog, Iso. And Jens would take Iso for a walk on the beach and leave me alone with, uh, with Ingel and Joachim. And the stories that Jens had told me was repeated by them from their ankle. And when I left their house that day, I felt obligated to tell this story because they felt such a gratitude towards all the professional people, all the anonymous people who had helped them through the darkness back in 2017. And for me, it became a proof of a system that worked. And it reassured me that when we stand together, we can actually uh, do magnificent things. Instead of being fascinated by the darkness, let's be fascinated by the light, um, which is the mantra of Ingrid Wahl. And, and I remember sitting there quietly in Jens's car driving home and after that meeting, this series would materialize. Suddenly, I would understand that I could buy portraying the professional procedures and portraying the friendship 
uh, I would be able to tell the untold story about this case. Personally, I've never met anybody stronger than England Joachim. I'm a parent. I have three young uh, kids. And I'm inspired by the way that they have kept their family and keeps their family together. Um, I'm inspired by their hospitality, their friendship, their uh, insistence on uh, on the light instead of the darkness. Um, and a beautiful friendship have grown out of it. And I am proud to think of them as very close friends, both to me and my three children and my wife. And we will, uh, you know, visit them often. Uh, and take a walk uh, on the beach and talk to them. So besides the fact that they allowed me to tell this story, which, of course, I'm grateful for, uh, a friendship also grew out of it. And then um, I would say that the power of of them, the portray that Penilla and Rolf does in the series is great, but the real deal is even better. The strength of the power of Joachim when he wants something or has an idea you better just follow because he's not going to give up. Uh, and that uh, uh, is, is is a great inspiration. So so in many ways, out of this tragedy that have changed me uh, uh, so much over the years that we've done this, uh, luckily uh, the friendship and the relationship with uh, with England Joachim has, has grown out of it. That's, that's very much a testament to the mantra that uh, you've just described, that the um, that the Vars live by, which is finding light in the darkness, which is even the willingness to be open to these kinds of friendships with the lead investigator into their daughter's killing and with somebody who wants to tell their story on a national platform. So I think that's really testament to um, to them and to their, to their strength. And then, of course, this tragedy has brought both you two together, you, Jens, and uh, Tobias. You've You've developed a friendship working together on this series. Um, how do you feel the pair of you have developed such a close bond throughout this process? From my perspective, this is all about trust. It has been absolutely incredible to meet Tobias, who has a natural gift, and ability to sit down and really listen with undivided attention and understanding. It was so important to me that he really saw the clear story that he was planning to tell. Because it really is Tobias' story, shaped by mine and others' experiences. But it was Tobias that very clearly saw the possibilities of the TV series that it became in the end. I feel that he chose the right angle, to go behind the scenes of the police work rather than doing the same as what the press coverage showed, to show the cooperation between the many involved departments and of course focusing on the real people and their stories. Working with him has also been a very overwhelming experience for me. The usual hierarchies were greatly tested. I'm used to being the boss, the old grumpy man, and here was this young man who was the boss of this project, so of course he was the one in charge. In order to really let go and open up, one has to trust the person you're speaking with, and it was very easy because Tobias inspires trust. I've sat with Tobias and told the honest truth about my own experiences, about the tough times. I cried in front of a man I've only just met. That was a strange process for me, but Tobias had the ability to make it a good process. He was also quick to bring along Danish pastries for our chats over cups of coffee, because the police loved this. So he also won me over that way. Only joking, but truth be told, it was Tobias' humanity, natural relatability and down-to-earth approach that allowed us to be able to laugh, cry and be serious simultaneously. It enabled him to get what he needed out of me to create this incredible, beautiful TV show. When you spend this many hours together, and when I ask Jens to put years of his lives in my hands to tell this story, uh, it's a very intimate moment, and it becomes a very personal relationship. Um, and a, a great friendship have grown out of that, and, and that reaches further than a, a TV show. It's kind of you skip, you know, 20 years of friendship and then you just jump right into the most intimate facts about your life and you spend hours and hours talking about that. So it's an unnatural uh, situation that you need to make natural. So from my perspective, Jens is a generous, very, very easygoing uh, person. And then underneath that, there is a great depth. Jens is a hero. And it has, of course, uh, uh, enriched my life to 
to meet a, a person of of this this size. He's a master. It's a real inspiration to hear the friendship that's developed between the two of you. The the things and, and that you know as a journalist and and that storytellers that you know go out there and 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 basically we are kind of parasites on real people's lives, and I believed that I had seen a beautiful, meaningful story by watching and learning about Jens's life. Um, and that, of course, is a very strange thing. I mean, you meet this stranger, and then you think by portraying this stranger's life, you can tell a story that is going to be important for people to watch. I mean, that that is a strange process. Um, and to be able to do that together always invites to to big uh, to big friendships, and then uh, the easy thing about about Jens is that he is, uh, you know, he's a human human. You trust him, and he normally works in very very difficult subjects, and he is the master of very difficult conversations. Clearly, as he is in in the investigation as well. And I've learned one thing from Jens that I have brought. Uh, with me in my life outside of the show, and that is, don't no beat around the bush. Just say it as it is, you know. Don't hide anything. Just be open and confront and see the world as it is. No more, no less. And if you do that, then it can go wrong. It can be emotionally challenging, but you won't be caught in a situation that you can't cope with because you've just been honest. And that sounds easier than it is. Uh, and I'm still learning, but I do believe that that is the most important lesson I have learned from Jens. I think that's a really wonderful sentiment to end this episode on. Thank you to you both for your um, honesty and your openness with everything that you've shared with us today. Thank you, Anna. It's been a privilege talking to you. You've been listening to Behind the Investigation podcast with me, Anna Kojirado. Thank you to our guests, Tobias Lindholm and Jens Müller, for sharing their insights with us today. There's still more to come. Join us next time, when Jens will be back with Tobias and will take a more in-depth look at the surprising techniques used to crack the so-called impossible case. Continue to follow the investigation by watching this limited series on HBO and streaming on HBO Max. Until next time.